When I was 15, I was shot in a convenience store robbery. I lay in a coma for three weeks before regaining consciousness. This is my account of what I experienced during those three weeks. I guess I just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. I walked out of the stifling July heat into the soothing air-conditioned coolness of the convenience store. My sole objective to buy some jumbo slushies for me and my friends waiting in the parking lot outside. I only had a couple of seconds to savor the cool air before things went awry. Hey! A voice shouted. I spun around in the direction of the counter. A tall, skinny guy in a leather vest, his head shaved and tattooed, was spinning in my direction, away from the terrified clerk who was trembling behind the open register, their hands held in the air. I didn't even get a chance to cry out in alarm. I had just enough time to register the guy's pockmarked face and jittery, wild, drug-addled eyes before the 9 millimeter he was aiming in my direction went off. I didn't hear the shot. A yellow flower bloomed in my vision. Then, blackness. I remember floating weightlessly through the blackness, drifting like a feather through the darkness of non-existence, blind and deaf in the void for what felt like an eternity. There was no pain, no sound, no light. Then, gradually, slowly, the blackness faded away. I regained consciousness and opened my eyes, thinking for a brief instant that it had just been a bad dream. Except I wasn't in my bed. I was lying on the floor of the convenience store. I shook my head and slowly got to my feet, dazed and perplexed. I quickly checked my t-shirts, but there was no blood, no bullet hole, no apparent wound. Then I touched my forehead the same. I felt relieved. The guy must have missed me and I passed out from shock. Then I realized how quiet it was in the convenience store and how gloomy it was. I looked around. I was shocked by what I saw. I hadn't noticed it before, being concerned with my miraculous near miss and the fact that I was still alive, but the convenience store was different. It had changed, no longer bright and clean. The counter and shelves were now covered with a thick layer of dust. There were cobwebs everywhere, and all the food and merchandise looked rotted and ancient. It looked like it was a convenience store that had been abandoned for years. It was dark, too. The fluorescent lights were off. The only lights, the natural daylight coming in through the now dirty windows. I was alone. There was no sign of the clerk or the guy with the gun. For a few seconds, I was so bewildered, I couldn't even react. I just stood there, looking around in a daze, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. Abruptly, I remembered my friends waiting for me outside. I turned and bolted through the entrance, the hinges of the door squealing with the sound of rusty, unoiled metal, as if the door hadn't been opened in ages. I stepped outside and stopped dead in my tracks. I looked around, stunned all over again. Outside was different, too. The parking lot asphalt was in a state of disrepair, cracked and crumbling. The gas pumps were rusted and dilapidated. There was no sign of my friends or our car, or anyone else and their car, for that matter. The parking lot was completely deserted. The only sound was the wind, a desolate eerie wail, like a mournful banshee. Everything was dull and nearly colorless, like an old sepia-tone photograph, as if the vitality of everything had been drained away, leaving it diluted and lifeless. I glanced up at the sky, minutes before, when I had first entered the convenience store. It had been a typical bright, sunny summer afternoon. Now the sky was overcast, a dismal, dark gray. I looked around for any sign of life, but there was nothing. Hello? I shouted at the top of my lungs. Is anyone there? My words were carried off by the wind. There was no reply. 
It was at this point that my confusion began to give way to something else. Fear. Only a few minutes before, I had been going into a perfectly ordinary convenience store on a perfectly ordinary summer afternoon, with no other intention than to buy some refreshments for me and my friends. Now I had survived an attempted murder, only to be awoken to find myself all alone in the same convenience store, except now it looked like it had been deserted for decades. What the hell is going on? I whispered to myself in a trembling voice. I remembered my phone and quickly pulled it out of my shorts, intending to call my parents, my friends, anyone who could tell me what's happened. The screen wouldn't come on. I fiddled with my phone, but it was dead. It didn't make any sense. I had just charged it earlier that morning. It had been broken when I passed out. Shit. I snapped in frustration and pocketed my useless phone. I stood there for a moment, thinking. The convenience store was only about three miles down the road from the neighborhood I lived in, so with no other options, I began to walk back that way. As I walked down the highway, my fear and astonishment only grew. It wasn't just the convenience store. I was walking through the small shopping plaza downtown, and I could see that all the buildings looked to be long deserted and in disrepair. The supermarkets, the strip malls, the fast food places had the look of derelict buildings in a ghost town. Everything was dirty and weather-beaten and aged. All the windows were dark. There was no electricity. What few cars dotted the parking lots were extremely rusted and sitting on flat, rotted tires. There was no sign of another living soul. It reminded me of photos I had seen in history class of the abandoned city of Chernobyl years after the disaster. I stopped in the middle of the road, turning slowly, looking around at the desolation all around me glancing up at the foreboding gray sky. No people, no animals. I haven't even seen a single bird in the sky. I sniffed the air. It smelled stale, flat, and lifeless. Dead. Like an empty house that had been closed up for a long, long time. And there was some other smell underneath. A faint odor I couldn't quite place. Then I realized what it was. The sickly sweet smell of death. Now fear was giving way to something closer to pure terror. Then, up ahead of me, I caught movement. I looked up, about thirty yards away, and saw a figure walking in the road. It looks to be a man wearing a suit. He was facing away from me, heading in the same direction I was. I felt a wave of relief at having finally found another person, someone I could talk to who might be able to explain what was going on. Hey! I shouted, and began sprinting towards the figure. Hey, uh, mister, wait up! As I got closer, I noticed something. The man seems to be walking very slowly, with a strange, staggering shuffle. I brushed it off, figuring maybe it was an old guy or a disabled person. Hey, mister! The figure stopped abruptly, swaying slightly. It began to turn slowly to face me. Do you think that you can... It turned all the way around, and I couldn't finish my sentence. My words trailed off as I exhaled the rest of the air in my lungs in a low, horrified gasp. I could feel my eyes growing wider. I took a step back staring in uncomprehending horror at the thing I had thought to be another living human being. It looked back at me, with black, eyeless sockets. Its nose was an empty cavity above its lipless mouth, its bare teeth set in a rictus grin. Its rotted skin was stretched tightly over its skull. It was little more than a skeleton in a filthy, rotted suit. It extended one of its bony hands towards me. It then let out a hideous, shrill howl of pure, animalistic rage. It took a shuffling step forward, and I compensated by retreating back a step, holding my hands in front of me. What? What? I began to stammer. It spoke. It spoke. Its voice a dry, choked rasp. 
It repeated it, louder. Life. Then, it shrieked furiously. Life. It suddenly charged at me, moving with frightening speed and agility, given its frail, decayed appearance. I spun around and bolted down the road. I could hear it chasing behind me. I ran at top speed, my heart racing, terrified out of my mind at this insane, incomprehensible nightmare I had found myself in. As I ran, I glanced over at the shopping plaza. There were more of those things in the parking lot, those walking corpses. At least a dozen, in various stages of decay, with more emerging from the darkened buildings, drawn by the screams of the enraged cadaver chasing me. And they were all running in my direction. As they got closer, I could hear they were screaming, too. And all of them were screaming the same thing. I don't know how long I ran. Maybe a mile or so. It's all a blur now in the extremity of my terror at that moment. I darted a glance back at one point and saw there was now at least thirty or forty of them chasing me. The one in the suit in the lead, less than ten yards behind me. They showed no signs of slowing down. My lungs felt like they were going to explode. I realized I couldn't run much longer. I was going to pass out. And then... I was going to die. Suddenly, in the middle of the road, about twenty feet ahead of me, I caught movement. A manhole cover was being pushed up and shoved aside. A head emerged from below ground. It was a man, a normal, living man. He emerged from the manhole, carrying a pistol grip, pump-action shotgun. He was filthy, and his clothes were torn and ragged, but he was alive. I stopped dead momentarily forgetting my pursuers, stunned by the sudden appearance of another human being. He looked at me. Get over here if you want to stay alive. I didn't pause to consider the pros and cons of going at the stranger who I had just met. I had no clue if he was friend or foe. All I knew was he was looking like better company than the welcome wagon currently behind me. I ran to him. He gestured down the manhole. Get down there, quick! He turned to the fast-approaching horde and fired a couple blasts from his shotgun. The lead corpse, the one in the suit, was hit in the head. As I watched, it let out a hideous shriek and collapsed, spasming on the ground before dissolving into a puddle of black liquid in an instant. I blinked in disbelief at what I had just seen. He turns to me. Now, he shouted and fired two more rounds. The rest of the horde was getting closer. I looked down and saw a metal ladder descending into darkness. I quickly began to climb down. My rescuer was right behind me. He paused at the top just long enough to drag the manhole cover back in place. It blotted out the light as it closed, leaving us in darkness. At the bottom of the ladder, I stepped off and looked around, panting. I was in a long, wide sewage tunnel. It was almost entirely pitch black. The man with the shotgun arrived at the bottom of the ladder. He leaned against it for a moment while he fumbled something out of his pocket. A click and a beam of light came on. A flashlight. Here, he told me. Hold this on me for a minute. I did as he said. He pulled some fresh shells out of his filthy jacket and began reloading his shotgun. I got my first good look at him. He was probably in his mid-twenties, with dark, sun-kissed eyes and a thin face covered with stubble. He finished loading the shotgun, then held out his hand for the flashlight. I handed it back to him. What's your name? He asked me. I told him, then asked him. Aaron, he replied. What the hell is going on? I demanded. What are those things? Where is everyone? Why is everything so fucking upside down? Aaron looked at me for a moment in silence, cocking his head slightly. What's the last thing you remember before everything went crazy? He asked me. What the hell is that? I began. Just tell me. I told him about the convenience store, the guy with the pistol, the gunshot, 
how I had passed out, then awoke to find the world had turned into hell while I had been out. When I finished, Aaron nodded to himself as if that was what he'd been expecting me to say. Now, would you mind telling me? I started. No. He cut me off. We don't have time for that now. We have to get back to the others. Others? I said, surprised. You mean there's more normal people? Yeah, a few. You better come with me if you want to stay alive. Where? The police station. He replied, pointing with his shotgun down the tunnel. It's a couple blocks down that way. It's the only safe place in town. He took off down the tunnel without another word, moving quickly. I hurried after him. Are there any of those things down here? I asked him, looking uneasily around in the dark. No, he said, without slowing down. But there might be soon. They saw us go down here. They might try to find a way down and follow us. Shit, I whispered, alarmed. That's why we have to get back to the station, Aaron answered. We went down the sewer tunnel for about twenty minutes. Then Aaron stopped at another ladder. This is it, he said, then started up. At the top of the ladder was another manhole cover. He pounded on it and said in a low voice, Open up. It's me. I heard the sound of something heavy being scooted away, then someone on the other side began to hoist up the manhole cover. A bright beam of light shone down the manhole, causing me to squint. I found someone else alive. Aaron told whoever was holding the light and pointed down at me. Then he climbed up. He peered down at me. You coming? I hesitated briefly, looking around the dark sewer tunnel nervously. Very faintly, I thought I heard a moan off in the distance. I quickly climbed up after him. At the top of the ladder, I crawled out onto a hard cement floor. I looked around, my eyes adjusting to the light. I was in what seems to be some kind of parking garage. Aaron was standing nearby with another man who looked to be in his mid-thirties. He was balding and slightly overweight. He was also armed with a shotgun. Did you find anything? The other man asked Aaron. Just him, Aaron replied, pointing at me. The other man looked at me. What's your name, kid? He asked. I told him, then looked to Aaron and said, You think you could tell me what the fuck's going on now? I guess you're new here. The other man muttered before Aaron could answer. What do you mean? I asked, confused. Meanwhile, Aaron had come back over and was sliding the manhole cover back in place. Nearby stood a wheelbarrow, loaded with cinder blocks. Well, for one thing, you're still alive. Most fresh meat doesn't last long around here. Secondly, you don't have the first fucking clue what this is all about. Well, that's what I've been trying to find out, I retorted. Who are you, anyway? Oh, sorry. Where are my manners? I'm Clark. What did you mean about fresh meat not lasting long around here? Eh, most new people who show up in Deadland are lucky if they last ten minutes before the residents make their acquaintance. The residents hate living folks. Now I was totally lost. Whoa, um, slow down. I don't know what you're talking about. A Deadland? Residents? We'll talk upstairs, Aaron told me. I'll explain everything. He finished moving the manhole cover back in place, then pushed the wheelbarrow full of cinder blocks on top of it. He looked at Clark. How's Lauren doing? Clark shook his head, his face grim. Not good. She's gotten worse just in the last hour. Shit, Aaron muttered. He turned back to me. Come with us. We'll take you up top and introduce you to the rest of the tourists. He and Clark started walking away. I got up and followed after them, looking around at my surroundings as we went. On the other side of the parking garage was an elevator. I started towards it instinctively, but Aaron stopped me. No electricity, he explained, then indicated a metal door next to it, labeled stairs. He opened it and the three of us entered a dark stairwell. I followed Aaron and Clark up several flights until they stopped at a landing with a door labeled Lobby. 
Aaron pushed it open and we stepped inside. I looked around. It was the lobby of our local police station. I recognized it from a field trip my sixth grade class had taken several years before, but like everything else in town, it was now aged, decrepit, and deserted. Hearing a sudden pounding sound, I jumped, startled, and spun around towards the main entrance. I felt my skin crawl in horror. Oh, Jesus Christ, I said in a low voice. The entrance doors have been secured with chains and padlocks. In the small windows at the top of the double doors, I can see at least a dozen of those walking corpses cluttered outside, pounding and moaning, trying to get inside. Don't worry about them, Aaron said. They can't get in here. What about the windows? I inquired. Reinforced bulletproof glass. Come on, Clark said. Let's introduce you to the rest of us. They guided me down a corridor and stopped at a door at the end. Printed on the frosted glass window at the top was Richard Dodson, Chief of Police. Aaron pounded on it. It's us. Open up. He called out. I heard the door being unlocked. Then it opened. I stood in the doorway, taking a look around. It was a spacious, well-decorated office. There were stuffed animal heads mounted on the walls. The room was lit by candles and several kerosene lanterns. There were four other people sitting around on small cots. Like Aaron and Clark, they were all disheveled, their clothes dirty and ragged. They looked at me seemingly without much interest, their faces grim and sullen. Aaron gestured with his arm around the room to each of them. This is Jeff, he said, indicating a skinny, awkward-looking guy only a few years older than me. Eighteen or nineteen, probably. Hey, I said in greeting, and Jeff gave me a brief nod in reply. Aaron nodded to a black guy in his early twenties. That's Dante, he said. Dante just stared at me with hard, blank eyes. Aaron pointed to a woman who appeared to be in her late twenties with long, stringy, dark hair. She was seated beside a cot on which lay a young girl who was probably no older than twelve. The girl seemed to be unconscious and looked sick. She was moaning and turning restlessly in her sleep. This is Nadine, he said, pointing to the older woman. And that's Lauren. He pointed to the sick girl on the cot. What's wrong with her? I asked, concerned. What the fuck does it look like? Nadine asked me harshly. She's dying. That's what's wrong with her. She picked up a wet washcloth and gently applied it to Lauren's forehead. She's been getting worse every day. Nadine went on a softer tone. And when she dies, she's going to... She didn't finish. Can someone please tell me what's happening? I said, looking around the room. One minute, I'm going into a convenience store to buy some drinks. The next, some psycho aims a gun at me. And the next after that, I'm being chased by a mob of freaks who look like extras in a Romero movie. Aaron sat down in a cot and sighed heavily. Okay, I guess you're entitled to an explanation. Go ahead and sit down. I'll tell you what's going on. But I don't think you're going to like what I have to say. He looked at me for a moment. So the last thing you remember is some nut firing a gun at you? He asked me. Yeah, I, I guess I got lucky and he missed. I passed out and woke up here, wherever the hell here is, I replied. At this, Nadine snorted contemptuously. You seriously don't get it, do you? You seriously haven't figured it out? I glanced at her, confused. What do you mean? She gave me a look that was half disgust, half pity. The guy with the gun didn't miss you at all. Bullshit. I pointed to myself. Do you see any bullet holes? Nadine's right, Jeff said, speaking for the first time. If he'd missed you, you wouldn't be here now. Where? I demanded. What the fuck is this place? Dante answered in a very soft, quiet voice. His words sent a chill down my spine. 
The land of the dead. That's where you are, dude. That's where we all are. What the fuck are you talking about? I asked, trying to sound tough, but I think my voice faltered slightly. I was getting scared. We got some bad news for you, Clark told me solemnly. All the religions had it wrong. There is no heaven or hell, no nirvana, no reincarnation, none of that bullshit. This, he waved his arm around, a motion that seems to indicate not just the room where we were in, but the entire world. This is all there is waiting for us on the other side. We call it Deadland. I stared at him, feeling a growing ball of cold dread in my stomach. Things were starting to become clear now. I was starting to see what they were getting at. Are... are you saying that I'm dead? That we're all dead? No, Aaron said. Not quite, anyway. Uh, technically, we're all still alive. We're stuck somewhere in the middle. Kind of like being in limbo. I... I don't understand any of this, I said, my voice shaking in fear. What year is it? Dante asked me suddenly, taking me by surprise. I looked at him, puzzled. What the fuck do you mean? I mean, what's the date you went into the convenience store? He said. It was uh, today, July 25th, 2015. His eyes widened. He looked stunned for a minute. Five years? Shit, he said quietly to himself. It's been five years since... Since what? Since the car accident, he told me. October 31st, 2010. Me and some friends were coming home from a Halloween party. We were kind of drunk, I guess, and crashed into a semi. That's how long I've been in a coma. What? I said loudly, shocked. It's true, Jeff said. We're all in comas right now. I was out swimming with some friends in a lake. I guess I hit my head on some rocks or something and almost drowned. I'm probably in a vegetable ward in a hospital right now on a respirator. What about you? I said to Nadine. She looked down at the floor and smiled bitterly. I had a little drug habit. Meth. My boyfriend got me turned on to it. I guess I got a bad batch. Either that or I overdosed. I looked at Clark. He shrugged. Brain tumor. I looked at Aaron. And you? Try to kill myself. I'm not going to tell you why. It doesn't matter now anyway. I didn't have a gun, so I figured the next best thing was to hang myself. Guess I messed it up somehow. I was quiet for a long time, struggling to absorb all of this. Was I just dreaming all of this? This couldn't really be happening. Finally, I looked up to Aaron. You said you were all technically still alive. Yeah, if we were dead, we'd be those things outside. Well, if we're still alive, what the hell are we doing in the land of the dead? Hey, don't expect us to have all the answers. Natalie snapped at me defensively. You think we haven't been over this before? They don't exactly hand you a fucking guidebook when you show up here. Maybe we're here because there's nowhere else for us to go. Jeff said grimly. No, I don't believe that. I protested. Maybe we're here as some kind of punishment. Maybe this is purgatory or hell or... Aaron interrupted me. When I first arrived here, one of the things I ran into was my grandmother. I recognized her by the dress she was wearing. It was the one she was buried in. She was the sweetest old lady you'd ever hope to meet. When she was alive, anyway. She tried to kill me, like all the others. He gave me a dark look. This isn't a punishment. Jeff's right. We're here because this is all there is to look forward to after death.
How long have you been here? I asked Aaron. He shrugged. About two years, I guess. Tried off in myself in 13, but time's weird here. It passes differently. A day could seem like a week. A week could seem like a day. He pointed to Nadine. Little Miss Friendly's been here the longest. Eight years. Fuck you, Aaron. She grumbled. Aaron ignored her. Tourists, that's what we call us, the living, come all the time. But most of them are dead before they even realize what's going on. The residents, that's what we call the dead folk, see to that. That is, if they're lucky enough to show up here during the day. If they wind up here after dark. He trailed off. What do they do? Eat them? I asked. He laughed without much humor. You've seen too many movies. No, they're not cannibals. They don't eat us. They kill us because they hate us. That's all. Pure and simple. Why? Who knows? Maybe they see us as intruders. Or maybe they're jealous because we're still alive and they're not. You ever try communicating with them? I asked. He shook his head. They don't have a whole lot to say. They're not very bright, and they're pretty single-minded. But they can be pretty damn clever, too. Watch your ass if you're going to wander around Deadland. You never know when you're going to fall into a trap. You're just lucky I happen to be heading out to scavenge for supplies and ran into you. I shrugged. Then a thought came to my mind. You shot that one, and it... it... it died. It, It melted. Yeah, they can be killed. Well, there's a fuck of a lot more of them than there are of us. But if they're already dead, and this is the land of the dead, where the fuck do they go after you kill them? He shrugged. Who knows? Detroit? Like Nadine said, none of us really have any answers. So, what's the plan? What do we do? I asked looking around at my new friends. The plan is to stay alive as long as possible. Nadine answered flatly. That's it? I said. You got a better idea? Dante asked. I didn't. I looked up at Aaron. You said living people like us show up all the time. Have any of them ever escaped from Deadland? Escaped how? Like, uh, gone back to the land of the living. Not that I know of. Most of them are pretty bad off in the normal world. Folks like us. Brain dead, paralyzed, terminally ill. People who are only alive because they're on life support and their families can't bring themselves to pull the plug. And when they do die, when someone does pull the plug, I already had an idea what the answer was going to be. They turn into residents, then they go after us. Doesn't matter how well they knew us or how close we were while they were alive. They see us as the enemy. It goes both ways, too, Clark added. What do you mean? I asked. If you die here, you die in the living world? I took a moment to absorb this all. So, what? We're just stuck here until we die in the real world, or those things catch us? That's about the size of it, Jeff muttered. And when we die, I couldn't finish. No one said anything for a while. A thought occurred to me. What about food? What do we eat? Aaron seemed amused by my question. Are you feeling hungry? He asked me. No, I said. Now that I think about it, I'm really not. And it was true, even though I hadn't eaten since that morning when I was still being a normal teenager, existing in a sane, bright, living world. I wasn't thirsty, either. Tourists don't have to eat or drink in Deadland, Aaron explained. We don't sleep, either. So on the bright side, we don't have to worry about starving. 
the unconscious young girl on the cot, Lauren, groaned again. What about her? I said to Aaron. You just said we don't sleep. She's not sleeping. She's dying in the real world. The closer you get to death there, the closer you get here. What's her story? I asked. She was in a house fire, Nadine explained with uncharacteristic softness. She gently wiped sweats off Lauren's brow with a cloth. My guess is she got burned pretty badly, and's probably in a medical-induced coma to keep her from feeling the pain. She's only been here for about a week. What feels like a week, anyway. Is there anything we can do for her? I asked. Nadine looked at me gravely. She reached behind her and pulled a handgun from the back of her jeans. She held it up for me to see. We can put her out of her misery. She'll die on the other side. Or we can wait for her to die there, and then shoot her to keep her from turning. Those are our only options. Jesus, I whispered. She laughed humorously. Who's that? In case you haven't been paying attention, kid, Jesus ain't gonna help us. He isn't even real. I looked at Aaron. I eyed the shotgun he was holding, then looked back to the handgun Nadine had. Where did you get the guns? Right here, Aaron replied. The station armory. There's not much ammo left, though. That's one of the things I was going out to search for when we bumped into each other. Those things know we're holed up in here? Yeah, but don't worry about them. This place is like a fortress. All the windows are barred on the outside. They can't get in. Why don't they try to burn the station down? Like I said, they're not too bright. Or maybe they're afraid of fire. He paused. His face turned to a look of concern. I'm worried about the sewers, though. Why? That's how we've been able to move around under the town to gather supplies without them detecting us. That mob that was chasing you saw us duck down there. They might be waiting for us next time we go out. What do we really need so bad that we have to go out at all? You said we don't need food or water. Clark answered for him. Ammo, for one thing, like Aaron said before. Also, gasoline, if there's any to be found. There's an emergency generator in the parking garage, but he needs juice. If we can get it going, we can have electricity. And we won't need all these fucking candles and lanterns to see. Yeah, we're getting low on candles, too. Nadine added. And a kerosene for the lanterns, Dante said with a strange sense of urgency in his voice. Aaron glanced out one of the barred windows. The light had dimmed outside. It's too late to worry about that today. It's getting dark. It's too dangerous to go out in the dark. We'll try for a supply run tomorrow. Wouldn't it make more sense to sneak out after dark when it'd be harder for those things to see us? I asked. Aaron shuddered in response to my question. For a brief second, a flash of fear crossed his face. It's not those zombies outside that we have to worry about after dark. What the fuck are you talking about? I demanded. Clark sighed and looked at me. There's something we didn't tell you before, kid. I guess we're saving the worst for last. What? I asked, fearfully. I remembered something Aaron had said earlier. Tourists come all the time, but most of them are dead before they even realize what's going on. The residents see to that. That is, if they're lucky enough to show up here during the day, if they wind up here after dark. Those walking corpses aren't the only thing out there, Aaron said. They're bad enough, but after it gets dark, you also have to watch out for the shadow lurkers. Shadow lurkers? I asked, already not liking the sound of it. What are those? We're not really sure. Aaron said. Maybe they're what those things became after you kill them. Or maybe they were never human to begin with. Maybe they're demons. They only come out at night, Nadine said, with a tremble of fear in her voice. They hide in the shadows. They're all over the place, watching us all the time, waiting for it to get dark. And then... Then what? Then they take you, 
Clark said quietly. They come out of the shadows, and if they catch you in the dark, they take you. What the fuck do you mean, they take you? Jeff, who had been silent for some time, spoke up. There was a guy who showed up here around the same time I did, about four months ago. Dave. He seemed like an okay guy. I guess we were kind of buddies. We were looking for supplies and got caught out after dark on the other side of town. It was really stupid. We knew better. But I guess we weren't paying attention. We tried to hide from the residents down in the basement of the old Methodist church. We only had one flashlight with us, and the batteries were running low. We decided to make a break for it, and try to get back here before they ran out completely. We ran up the stairs. Dave was right behind me, but he tripped and fell back down. He hurt his leg. I started down to help him, and I saw this thing come out of the darkness behind him. It was like a living wall of shadows, and it had eyes, glowing red eyes. I shined my light on Dave to try to protect him, but the beam was too weak, too dim. It, it fell over him, enveloped him like a wave. He didn't even have time to scream, it was that quick. And then it receded back into the dark, and he was gone. Just gone. There wasn't a trace left of him. I stared at him, chilled to the bone by his story. I found my voice. Then what happened? I ran until I found a manhole and used the sewers to get back to the police station. The whole time my flashlight was getting dimmer and dimmer. I kept expecting it to go out at any time, and the same thing that happens to Dave happens to me. But I made it back, just barely. The shadow lurkers never come out during the day, Aaron said. Even in places that are always dark, like sewers or basements, they need it to be truly dark, and they're scared of light sources. That's why we need candles and lanterns, Dante added. They keep them away during the night. But we're running low, Clark said grimly, and it's getting harder to find more around town. Supplies are dwindling. We have enough to get through tonight, if we're lucky, Nadine added. After that, she shrugged. Shit, I muttered. This town's pretty well picked clean, Aaron said. Tomorrow, I'm going to try to head for the next town to find supplies. Aaron, no, it's too dangerous, Clark began to protest. It has to be done. He cut Clark off. We need candles and batteries for the flashlights, and more ammunition. Maybe we can even find gas for the generator. The nearest town is ten miles away, I said. How are you going to get there? Is there a car? No. All the cars are long dead. Besides, driving in a car would draw too much unwanted attention. I'll go on foot. Should only take a couple hours both ways. Plus another hour to stock up. He looked over at the group. Any of you guys in? I'll come, Dante said immediately. Yeah, me too, I guess, Jeff said with some hesitation. Aaron looked at me. How about you, new meat? You up for some adventures tomorrow? Actually, no. I'd had all the adventures that day that I could stand for a lifetime and I didn't want to leave the relative safety of the police station and venture back out into the hellish world outside. But Aaron had saved my life, and I didn't want to turn my back on him and leave him and the others to go on a dangerous mission to gather supplies from the next town, a mission they might not come back from. I felt like I would be betraying him. So, I forced myself to say, Sure, why not? He nodded. Pleased. Good. He looked out the window. It was dark now. I could still hear the living dead moaning outside. It's getting late, so let's try to get some sleep. I thought you said we didn't need sleep in Deadland, I pointed out. We don't, Nadine explained. But if we try hard enough, we can doze off for a while. It helps pass the time and takes our minds off all of this. 
Whose turn is it to stand guard? Clark asked the group. Jeff went last night, so it's Dante's turn, Aaron said. Dante nodded, and Aaron handed him his shotgun. If she, Aaron indicated Lauren, dies while we're asleep, you know what to do. Dante nodded somberly. A pained look came over Nadine's face at this exchange, but she didn't say anything. She stroked the unconscious girl's face gently, brushed back her hair, and whispered something into her ear. Then she lay down on the cot next to her and closed her eyes. The rest of us, except Dante, did the same. Dante stood vigilant beside the door of the police chief's office, holding the shotgun. I lay down on a cot, closed my eyes, and tried to doze. My mind felt like an overloaded computer trying to process everything that had happened to me that day. I still couldn't fully believe this was all actually happening. Eventually, I managed to fade away into a state of half-sleep. I woke up some time later. I sat up and looked around, confused. I was alone in the police chief's office. All the other cots were empty, and the light was too dim. I looked over and saw a single candle flickering on the desk, the only one still burning. The rest had gone out while I had been dozing. The candle was burned down all the way to the bottom, producing only a feeble glow of illumination, its flame sputtering weakly. As I watched, my heart racing, it went out with a hiss, casting the room into darkness. I heard an ungodly roar that seemed to come from all around me, from above and below. I jerked my head up and saw dozens, no, hundreds, of glowing, malevolent red eyes glaring at me from the blackness of the ceiling. I opened my mouth to scream, but the blackness fell upon me like a sheet before I could utter a sound. I opened my eyes and screamed. I looked around, my heart still thudding in my chest. I was surprised to see I was back in my own bedroom at home. I tried to get my wildly beating heart under control and catch my breath. An enormous wave of relief overwhelmed me. It had all just been a nightmare. The worst fucking nightmare I had had in my life. I thought I might actually break down in tears for a second. A familiar voice spoke from outside my door. Honey, are you alright? Before I could answer, my door opened, and my mother, wearing her robe, stepped in and turned on the light. She looked at me with an expression of concern. I heard you scream. I have never been so glad to see her. I found my voice. I'm okay, Mom. It's just a bad dream. That's all. She came over and placed a reassuring hand on my shoulder. Do you feel better now? Yeah, a lot better. I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. She told me with a voice of sad regret. I looked at her, puzzled. What, Mom? She looked at me as I watched, her skin shriveled, pulling tightly to her skull, her lips drawing back from her teeth, transforming her mouth into a hideous, rictus grin. Her nose rotted away before my eyes, leaving only a gaping nasal cavity. Her eyes sank into her skull, leaving only hollow black sockets. This all happened in less than two seconds. The desiccated, decayed cadaver that had been my mother loomed above me. It spoke, its voice a horrible, guttural rasp. You're still dreaming. It leapt on top of me, and I sat up with a gasp, my eyes darting around frantically. I was on my cot in the police chief's office. The others curled up on their cots around me. The candles were all still burning. I sat there, feeling paranoid, wondering if I was really awake this time. Bad dream? A voice asked, startling me. I looked over and saw Dante leaning against the far wall, the shotgun standing beside his leg. Yeah, the worst, I told him, 
brushing my hair back with a trembling hand. Yeah, we all have them once in a while. Weird, ain't it? If you think about it, we're already asleep in the real world. It's like we're dreaming inside a dream. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess so, I replied, and then shrugged. Or not. I don't know anymore. Dante looked away from me, seeming to stare off into space. Nothing makes much sense around here. I keep trying to tell myself this whole fucking thing's just some long nightmare, and sooner or later, I'm gonna wake up. But it never happens. Well, if it makes you feel better, you're not alone, I told him. I took out my phone to check the time, but the battery had died while I was dozing. Hey, Dante, what time is it? He shrugged. Who the hell knows? Like Aaron said, time's messed up here. I only feel like I've been standing here for like five minutes, but look. He gestured towards the window. I looked and saw murky gray light outside. Daylight. Well, at least the sun's up, I said. Then added, that, well, sort of. I can't even remember the last time I saw actual sunlight, Dante told me, with a look of sad longing. Every day here is the same. Gray, dull, dead. The others began to stir. One by one, they began to awaken. They came fully awake the moment their eyes opened, like a switch had been flipped. None of them yawned or seemed groggy. Aaron saw the daylight outside. Well, we got through another night anyway, he offered, as if it was some consolation. Nadine immediately got up to check on Lauren. She looked worse than she had the night before. Her skin was whitish-gray, and her breathing was very weak. I don't think she's gonna last, Nadine began. Lauren suddenly gasped and jerked violently. She jerked again, and then went still. She stopped breathing. Oh god, Clark said softly. She's gone, isn't she? The sound of Aaron racking the slide on his shotgun. I spun around to him. He raised the shotgun in Lauren's direction, his face grave but determined. Nadine, get away from her. You know what has to be done. Nadine stepped protectively in front of the girl's dead body, between her and Aaron's shotgun shielding her. No, stay away from her. You knew this was coming, Nadine. She's gonna turn. You're not touching her, Aaron. No one is. Nadine pulled her handgun from the back of her jeans and aimed it at Aaron. I'll kill anyone who does. In response to Nadine pulling her gun on Aaron, Clark aimed his own shotgun at her. Put the gun down, Nadine. Don't make this any worse than it already is. Shut up, Clark. Nadine yelled at him without taking her eyes off of Aaron. Aaron, if you shoot her, so help me. She's turning. Jeff screamed in a panicky voice and pointed to Lauren's cot. I had been distracted by the ongoing standoff, but now I turned my eyes to Lauren's body and saw it was beginning to twitch. Her fingers were starting to move. Her eyelids began to flutter. Oh shit, Dante said in a voice barely above a whisper. Everybody, get back, Aaron yelled. Don't get too close to her. I recoiled several feet, my mind feeling dazed, reality seeming to float away from me. I felt like I was witnessing a scene from a horror movie from the perspective of one of the characters. Lauren sat up violently on the cot, emitting a hideous howl of inhuman rage. Her eyes opened. They were dead white. We looked at her, our eyes wide in shock. Jesus Christ, Clark moaned. Hate life, hate living. The thing that had been Lauren shrieked. Hate life, hate living. She lunged in the direction of the person closest to her, Nadine. Nadine spun towards her, aiming her handgun away from Aaron and pointing it at Lauren's face. As she pounced on her, 
She shot her point blank in the forehead. Blood and brain matter exploded from the back of Lauren's head as she tumbled to the floor, lying there motionless for a few seconds, before her body dissolved into black slime, which immediately evaporated. All that remained were her clothes. The gun fell from Nadine's hand, falling to the floor with a clunk. She stood there, motionless, like a statue, her face blank. Then, very softly, she began to weep. She lowered her head, her shoulders shuddering. Aaron started to step towards her, as if to comfort her, but she pointed her finger at him and said sharply, No. She looked around the room at the rest of us, her eyes still wet from tears, but cold and steely. Stay away from me, all of you. Just leave me alone. She marched out of the office, slamming the door behind her. I could still hear her sobbing in the corridor. We stood there, looking at each other. Me, Clark, Dante, Jeff, and Aaron. Then we lowered our heads and looked at Lauren's empty clothes on the floor, standing like mourners gathered around a grave. Nadine came back in about twenty minutes later. She had stopped crying and was composed, her icy, standoffish facade back in place. Her eyes were still red, but her voice was even as she spoke with hard resolve. All right, she said, sitting down on her cot angrily. She's dead, and it's over with. She flashed us a glare as her voice turned hostile. Don't any of you fucking tell me you're sorry. It won't change a goddamn thing. She looked down, glowering at the floor. A moment of silence passed. I broke it, turning to Aaron. So, when do we head out? The sooner the better, he told me. We don't know how much daylight we have to work with. Sometimes it goes fast, and sometimes it seems to stretch out for days. We gotta keep an eye on the sky. Let's take inventory first, Clark said. See how well we're stocked right now. It only took a few minutes. We were down to two and a half candles and one half-full kerosene lantern. Now let's check our ammo situation, Aaron said. Everyone unloaded their guns, and we tallied up the ammunition on the police chief's desk. There were 18 shotgun shells, 29 45 ACPs, and 36 9mm. Not much, but it's gonna have to do, Aaron said, as they reloaded their weapons. He surprised me by handing me a 9mm Beretta. You think you can handle that? I think so, I replied, turning the pistol over in my hands. Ever fire a gun before? Dante asked me. No, but I played a lot of video games. The safety's on the side, Aaron pointed. When you see that red dot, that means you're good to go. It'll kick like crazy when you pull the trigger. Make sure you got a good grip on it or it'll fly out of your hand. It'll make a fuck of a loud noise, too. Be warned. Let's get going, Dante said. Aaron turns to Nadine. Keep an eye on things while we're gone. She nodded. Watch your asses out there. Clark lit the lantern with a match and picked it up. We followed him out of the office and took the stairs back down to the underground garage. Clark pushed the wheelbarrow full of cinder blocks off the manhole cover, then used a crowbar to pull it up. Aaron shined his flashlights down into the sewer tunnel. He motioned for us to be quiet and listened intently. I heard nothing but silence. Wait up here for a minute, he whispered to the rest of us, and descended the ladder. He unslung his shotgun and aimed it around, holding his flashlight beneath it police style. A minute passed. Then he motioned up at us to follow him. One by one, we climbed down into the sewer tunnel. Me, Jeff, and Dante. We joined Aaron at the bottom. Looks clear, he told us. I was afraid some of them might have followed us down here after yesterday. He looked up at Clark and nodded at him. Clark looked down the manhole at us. Good luck, guys, he said, 
and slid the manhole cover back in place. Here, hold this for a minute, Aaron told me, handing me his flashlight. He took out an old, frayed, and creased sheet of paper, unfolding it and holding it against the sewer wall. It was a schematic of the sewer system that ran beneath the town. A red X he had drawn marked the location of the entrance beneath the police station. He studied the map carefully, tracing his finger along it. The sewers run all the way to the edge of town, he said. That's only a couple of miles away. From there, we can take the highway on foot to the next town. Ten miles. Why not just go into the city? I asked. That's a fuck of a lot closer. The nearest city was only five miles out of town in the opposite direction. He shook his head. Way too dangerous. A lot of dead folk. More than we can handle. Safer to avoid heavily populated areas and stick to smaller towns. He put away the map. Let's get moving. We followed him down the sewers. He seems to know the layout pretty well. We made several turns. Some of the tunnels seemed to be as wide as an airplane hangar. Others were so narrow we had to go through them single file. I don't know how much time passed. Half an hour, maybe, but eventually we came to a dead end. There was a ladder leading up. Aaron took out the map and looked at it again. This should be it, he said. He climbed the rungs to the top and forced the heavy iron manhole cover up with his shoulders. He scooted it aside. I could see a disk of dismal gray daylight above. He climbed out and looked around. He looked down at us. Looks good. Come up. I climbed up to the top, and Aaron took my hand, helping me out. I looked around as Dante and Jeff climbed up after me. We were in the middle of the highway on the outskirts of town. Open farmland surrounded us. In the normal world, it was late summer, and the crops had already been coming in pretty good. Here, like everything else, they were long dead and rotted. I looked again, creeped out once more by the barren, desolate, lifeless world around me. Even the trees were dead, their branches bare, as if it were late fall instead of July. There were none of those living corpses in sight. Dante and Jeff climbed out onto the highway. Then Aaron slid the manhole cover back in place. He took a can of orange spray paint out of his jacket and painted a large X on the road beside it, presumably so we could find it on the way back. Let's get moving, he told us. Keep your eyes open and watch your backs. We started walking in the direction of the next town. Aaron was in the lead, shotgun in hand, constantly stopping to scan our surroundings for any sign of trouble, using a pair of binoculars he had brought along. I was walking beside him with Dante, and Jeff was behind us. None of us spoke as we walked. An hour, maybe, passed. I had walked several miles by then, but I didn't realize I didn't feel dehydrated or thirsty. And I wasn't sweating. To break the silence, I decided to make small talk with Dante beside me. I turned to him. Nadine was pretty protective of Lauren, wasn't she? I said in a low voice. Yeah, she liked the kid, even though she wasn't with us for very long. They were close. He paused, then looked at me. Don't tell Nadine I told you that, or she'll fucking murder me. This is just between us. Deal? Deal. Lauren reminded Nadine of her little sister. They had a pretty rough life, I guess. Their dad was a real shitbag. He used to, well, loan them out, I guess you could say. Had to pay rent money. Fuck, I whispered. Yeah, Nadine's sister killed herself when she was 13, and Nadine was 17. That's why she's so messed up. Why she took Lauren's death so hard. I didn't know what to say. The silence resumed. We walked on. We were coming up on a farm beside the road. It looked long deserted but Aaron motioned for us to stop. He raised his binoculars to his eyes and studied the farmhouse for a couple minutes. I think I saw something moving around in there. Residence, Jeff asked. What else? Aaron lowered his binoculars. We'll have to get off the road. It's too dangerous to pass this house. It's too close. Fuck, Dante muttered. What else are we going to do? 
I asked. We'll duck into the field, Aaron said, pointing to our left. Circumvent the house. Come back on the road after we clear it. We have guns, I pointed out. Why not just shoot them? We don't know how many could be in there, he said, and our ammo is limited. If they see us, they'll follow us into town. We stepped off the road, crouching low and slipping into the field, moving low through the rotted corn stalks. We hadn't gone more than a few feet before Aaron halted, motioning for silence. We stopped, listened. You hear that? Aaron whispered to us. I listened and heard something. I couldn't believe it. It was a human voice, calling from off in the distance. I couldn't make out what it was saying at first, but it gradually got louder as whoever it was got closer. A man's voice, calling out repeatedly. Hello? Is there anyone there? Hello? Jesus, Jeff whispered. Someone else is out here. Aaron peered through the stalks and raised his binoculars. Someone's coming down the road, he told us. Uh, who? I asked. Some guy. Looks like he hadn't been here for long. Fresh meat. Let me see, I said. He handed over his binoculars, and I looked through them. Through the magnified lenses, I could see the figure of a man walking down the highway, coming from the direction we were headed in. He looked middle-aged, and was wearing a suit and tie. His clothes, while somewhat rumpled, still looked relatively clean. He was looking around wildly, disoriented and alarmed, calling out over and over with desperation. Hello? Please, is anyone around? I need help. I've been in a car accident. I, I can't find my wife. What are we going to do? I whispered to Aaron. Aaron shrugged his face, grim. Nothing we can do. We have to help him. We can't just leave him there. He doesn't know what's going on. We can't help him, he told me shortly. It's too risky. If we break our cover, we risk being spotted. I started to protest, but Dante cut me off. He's right, kid. Even if we tried to warn him, he wouldn't understand what was going on. And if we tried to explain, he'd think we were crazy. Dude's a goner. I turned back to the road, watching, helplessly, feeling sick. The man was approaching the farmhouse. A figure appeared in the doorway, drawn by his voice. I couldn't distinguish any of its features at this distance, until I raised the binoculars and saw its empty, black eye sockets and decaying face. The man spotted the figure in the doorway. He began running towards it, a note of relief in his voice. Oh, thank God. Hey, please, I need help. I've been in an accident. Do you think you can... It wasn't until he was almost upon the figure that he saw it for the horrible, decomposed mockery of a human being it was. He froze in his tracks, quivering with shock and horror. He began to back away, but it was already too late. The corpse pounced upon him, pulling him to the ground. Other corpses began to emerge from the farmhouse behind it, at least half a dozen, all of them shouting that familiar mantra. <laughs> The others looked away, Aaron staring down at the ground, but I watched. The man screamed wildly and struggled as they grabbed a hold of him and began to tear him apart, limb from limb. He screamed right up until they twisted his head off his shoulders. They hoisted his body parts up to the sky victoriously, like gruesome trophies. I turned away, feeling nauseous. Let's keep going, Aaron said. We moved on. We crept through the cornfield for several hundred yards. Then Aaron decided it was safe enough to venture back onto the highway. I glanced back at the farmhouse behind us, but at this distance, I could see no sign of movement. We continued our journey. I was still pretty disturbed and sickened by what we had witnessed. Dante noticed how shaken I was, and gave me a commiserating pat on the shoulder. This happens all the time, 
You get used to it after a while, if you last around here long enough. If you say so, I muttered. Those things did him a favor. If it hadn't been them, it would have been the Shadow Lurkers after it got dark. I don't know about you, but if I had a chance, I'd rather go out with the residents than face the Lurkers. I didn't respond. Another hour or so passed. Buildings began to appear in the distance. We were about a mile from the next town. A dilapidated gas station slash convenience store stood on the outskirts of town. Aaron surveyed it with his binoculars. It looks good, he said. No sign of trouble, but there might be some of them inside. We ought to make sure it's clear. We approached the gas station and snuck behind a pump, peering around the side. Aaron told us to stay put and crept up to the entrance, shotgun raised. He pushed open the door and entered the darkened station. He disappeared from sight. A couple minutes passed. My heart began to race with anxiety. Then, to my relief, he appeared in the doorway and indicated that it was safe. We followed after him and went inside. The interior of the gas station was dark and the air was stale. I had a flash of deja vu, remembering how I had first awakened in this nightmare in a similar gas station. Had this just been yesterday, it already felt like a lifetime ago. We began to look around for anything useful. There wasn't much that would do us any good. All the food was rotted, not that we needed to eat anyway, and there wasn't much else apart from the standard selection of motor oil, car air fresheners, and other automotive accessories. Aaron grabbed a couple two-gallon plastic gas cans from a shelf. Let's see if those pumps outside have any gas in them, he said and we followed him back outside. How are we going to get gas if the power's out? I asked him. He gave me a sly smile. Watch and learn. He walked over to a round iron plate set into the concrete parking lot. He crouched down and reached into the back of his pants, removing a pocket knife. He pulled out the blade and used it to pry open the plate. Immediately, the smell of gasoline hit my nostrils. There was a metal pipe leading straight down into the ground. This goes right into the supply tank under the pumps, Aaron said. He looked to Dante. You got the hose? You bet, Dante said, fishing a length of rubber hose that had been bundled together out of his pants. He tossed the rubber hose, it was about twelve feet long, to Aaron, who uncoiled it and fed one end down into the pipe. He pushed it down until only about two feet remained then sucked forcefully on the other end. He did this several times until he pulled his mouth away sharply, coughing violently, spitting out gasoline. A steady stream of gasoline was now trickling from the hose. Quick, give me one of those cans, he gasped, still coughing. Jeff handed him one, and Aaron pushed the hose into it. Dante, stand guard and keep a lookout for trouble, he said. This could take a while. Slowly but surely, the gas can filled up. Dante stood watch with his shotgun while he waited. After the first can was full, Aaron repeated the process with the second one. Finally, he was finished. He stood up, stretching. All right, now we got some gasoline. It's four gallons, not much, but a good start. You really think we can get that generator going? I asked him. I hope so. I think Clark can get it running. He was a mechanic in his other life. He turned and looked in the direction of the town. Okay, let's check out the town. This is where it gets dangerous, so watch your backs. We began to approach the town. Aaron and Dante in the lead, shotguns at the ready, me and Jeff behind them, each of us carrying one can of gasoline. We passed a trailer park, then some real houses, a few at first, then more. We were in a small residential area. Up ahead a few blocks was an elementary school. I looked around as we walked, my skin feeling cold and prickly with uneasy dread. The only sounds were the eerie, moaning wind in our breathing. There wasn't a sign of life, or death for that matter. I haven't seen a single one of those things since that farmhouse, I whispered to Jeff. Where the hell are they? Most of them are probably inside, he whispered back. 
Dead folks don't go out very much, unless there's living folk around. Just don't draw any attention to yourself. Keep quiet and walk slowly. We walked by the grade school and its eerie, deserted playground. Next, we passed an apartment complex, more houses, the town high school, and a church. We were near the center of town, the business district. There was a shopping center containing a strip mall, a scattering of fast food joints, a movie theater, and, on the other side of a vast parking lot, a Walmart. Bingo, Aaron said when he spotted the Walmart. We can find everything we need right there. He glanced up at the foreboding gray sky. We only got a few hours of daylight left. Let's get this over with. We moved across the vacant parking lots to the Walmart. The automatic doors were dead since there was no electricity, but Aaron jimmied them open with a small crowbar he had tucked under his belt. We entered. Aaron took out his flashlight and clicked it on. He pushed the safety off his shotgun. Dante did likewise. We have to make sure this place is safe, he whispered to us. Stay close together. I looked at Jeff and saw fear glistening in his eyes. We set down our gas cans and took out our handguns. The four of us did a careful sweep of the dark store, from one end to the other. Aaron shined his light down the deserted aisles. The place was empty. We were alone. We went back to the front of the store to the restrooms. One last place to check, Aaron told us. He looks to Dante, who nodded. Raising their shotguns, they stepped first into the men's room, aiming their guns and flashlights around, then did the same in the woman's room. They stepped out, lowering their shotguns, visibly relaxed. It's clear, Aaron announced, then grinned. Let's go shopping. First, let's get some packs to carry our stuff in, Dante said. The four of us headed to the sporting goods section, and each of us selected a large camping backpack. All right, Aaron said. Let's move quickly so we can get done and get going. We need candles, batteries, kerosene, ammo, and more flashlights. We'd move faster if we split up, Dante suggested. Good thinking. All right, Jeff, you can go with Dante to look for candles and batteries. You, he pointed to me, come with me. We split up, Dante and Jeff heading to the other side of the store. I followed Aaron over to the handgun and outdoor section. There was a large glass rifle case against the back wall and shelves loaded with boxes of ammunition. Aaron scanned the ammo with his flashlight. Shit, no pistol ammo, but plenty of shotgun shells. He glanced at the rifle case. Might as well grab some more shooting irons while we're at it. The case was locked, but he pried the lock off with his crowbar. He was just reaching in to grab another shotgun when there was suddenly commotion from the other side of the store. A sharp, snapping sound, like a whip being flicked through the air. Then a cry of pain, followed by a hollow, metallic, booming noise. Dante's voice called out to us from across the store. He sounded alarmed. Aaron, get over here, uh, quickly, home goods. Shit, Aaron said in a shaky voice. Him and I exchanged concerned looks, then raced across the store in the direction of Dante's voice. We could still hear those cries of pain, interspersed with that strange booming sound, like a gong being struck. It kept coming in an infrequent, erratic pattern. We arrived at the home goods and ran down an aisle towards the glow of Dante's flashlight. He was standing there, looking up at something above him that we couldn't make out in the dark. He turned to face us as we reached him, a panicked expression on his face. What the fuck is going on? Aaron demanded. Then, before Dante could answer, he looked around and asked, Where's Jeff? Up here. Jeff's agonized voice called out from above us, startling me and Aaron. We jerked our heads up, and Aaron shined his light. Oh Christ, Aaron exclaimed in shock. Jeff was dangling from the air about twelve feet above us, spinning around in a slow, lazy circle. He was grimacing in pain, eyes squeezed shut, teeth bared. You get me down, he wailed. It hurts. He thrashed around, struggling to free himself, and there was that metallic booming sound, much louder now that we were right underneath him. It seems to reverberate through the store. 
What the fuck? I said in a disbelieving voice. Aaron raised his flashlight and pointed. Look. I saw. Jeff was hanging from a thin metal wire that was wrapped tightly around one ankle. The wire was sunk deeply into the skin of Jeff's ankle. So deep it was bleeding. Aaron raised the beam of his light, following the wire up to a small hole in the ceiling where it disappeared from sight. He was walking ahead of me, Dante explained. He stepped onto it and it snapped him off his feet and yanked him into the air. It's a trap, Aaron said grimly. Those motherfuckers set a trap. We gotta get him down from there, Dante said. Jeff screamed in pain and began to struggle again, causing that booming sound again. Metal clanging against metal. What the fuck is making that sound? Aaron shouted, asking no one in particular. And the realization sank in. I realized what it sounded like. A bell. A big bell. The kind you'd find in a clock tower or a church steeple. It's a bell, I said, my lips feeling numb as if they'd been injected with Novocaine. It must be on the roof. Understanding dawned on Aaron's face, followed by horror. He looked to Dante. Stay here with him. Then, without another word, he bolted towards the front of the store in the direction of the entrance. I was right behind him. We arrived at the entrance and stopped dead, staring through the glass doors at the parking lot outside. I felt my eyes growing wide in their sockets with horror. My heart began to race. Oh my god, Aaron said in a strengthless voice. Oh no. Outside, a horde of walking corpses was approaching the store. Dozens of them. No. Hundreds of them. We gotta get those doors shut, Aaron screamed at me, indicating the glass entrance doors that were still gaping open a couple feet from where he'd pried them apart earlier. I ran to the one on the right, and he ran to the left. We started to push on them, trying to slide them shut. Aaron's moved pretty easily, but mine seems to be stuck on its tracks. I can't get it to move, I screamed at him, throwing a frantic look outside. The fast-approaching horde of the living dead was closing in on the store, drawn by the bell ringing on the rooftop. The closest was no more than ten yards away. I could already hear their repetitive, single-minded chanting. Aaron had his door pushed in as far as it would go, but there was still about a two-foot gap. He rushed over to my side and grabbed the edge of the jammed door. Push, goddammit, put your fucking back into it, he shouted at me, and together we began to shove on the door with our combined strength, straining with the wild desperation of cornered animals. It slides over a couple inches, then a couple more, then a whole foot. Then it jammed again. Fuck, Aaron shouted and began pounding on it in a frenzy. The mob of rotting corpses was only a few feet away. My nostrils were overwhelmed with a repulsive stench. With a final superhuman effort, Aaron shoved his entire body against the door. With a squeal, it started to slide shut. But then a corpse threw itself into the remaining six-inch gap. It shrieked and reached for us with a skeletal finger. Its loathsome, shriveled face was only a few inches from mine. Life. It screamed at us, trying to force itself inside the store. It was preventing the door from shutting the rest of the way. Get back! Aaron shouted at me, leveling his shotgun. I ducked back, and he fired point-blank. The corpse's head exploded. Instantly, it dissolved into that foul black sludge. I quickly slid the door shut the rest of the way, and not a second later, the horde was slamming against it from the other side. I hurriedly flipped the lock. Before I could even begin to relax, Aaron grabbed my shoulder. I turned to him. There's a second entrance on the other end, he shouted, pointing. We ran across the length of the store and arrived at the other entrance just as the horde was beginning to force the doors apart. Aaron hammered at their protruding fingers until they withdrew. Then he shoved the door closed and turned the lock. We staggered back, trying to catch our breaths, our hearts pounding. 
The corpses moaned and pounded on the glass. Can they smash through that? I panted at Aaron, pointing to the glass. Maybe eventually, but it'll take them a while, he replied. Shadow-resistant safety glass. We're safe for now. He pumped the shotgun, ejecting the spent shell, then slung it over his shoulder. Let's get back to Dante and Jeff. We trudged back through the store. Dante was staring up at Jeff. He looked at us anxiously. What the fuck is going on? We got the door shut and locked, Aaron explained. But we can't get back out that way. There's hundreds of them out there. Fuck, Dante said. We looked up at Jeff, still suspended from the ceiling. He was groaning and apparently only semi-conscious. His leg, the one caught in the wire, was bleeding badly, and the skin on his ankle was discolored from the lack of circulation. We gotta get him down from there, Dante said urgently. And fast, or he's gonna bleed to death. A ladder. We need a ladder, and something to cut that wire, Aaron said. Let me see if I can find something in hardware, I said. Dante, Aaron, and I rushed to the hardware department. Aaron found a stepladder, which I helped him carry, and Dante grabbed some bolt cutters. We hurried back to Jeff. Aaron quickly set up the ladder next to where Jeff was hanging, and Dante handed him the bolt cutter. He climbed the ladder until he was parallel to Jeff. He looked down at me and Dante. Get ready to catch him when he drops, he said, then raised the bolt cutters to the wire. One, two, three. He snipped the wire, and Jeff fell with a scream. Dante and I caught him in our arms and lowered him as gently as possible to the floor as Aaron descended the ladder. We knelt down to examine Jeff. He was unconscious. Shit, Dante said. Is he dead? Aaron checked his pulse. No, just passed out. Aaron carefully pulled the loop of wire encircling Jeff's ankle free and inspected his ankle. Christ, he said, appalled. It cut deep. I don't think it severed his artery, though. Hand me the flashlight, I said. I'll get some medical stuff from the pharmacy. Aaron gave it to me, and I went and found a first aid kit. I brought it back, and Aaron carefully wrapped a dressing around Jeff's ankle. He's gonna need stitches when we get back, he said. So now what? Dante asked Aaron. We gotta get the fuck out of here, but we can't go out front. Maybe we can sneak out back, I suggested. Yeah. That's what we'll do. What about him? Dante pointed to Jeff, who was slowly coming to. He opened his eyes and looked around, confused for a second, then he winced from the pain in his ankle. How are you feeling, Jeff? Aaron asked him. Like shit. My ankle hurts like hell. You think you can walk on it? Dante asked. He shook his head instantly. No fucking way. It feels like it's broken. Aaron and Dante looked at each other, dismayed. We're gonna have to carry him, Dante said. We can't carry him all the way back to the police station. Maybe we can cart him back or something. A, a wheelchair, maybe. Shit, does Walmart even stock wheelchairs? What about the wheelbarrow? I asked. That's an idea, Aaron said. Let's go see if we can find one, I said. Aaron and I went into the gardening section. We found a decent-sized wheelbarrow and rolled it back to Jeff and Dante. Let's lift him up, Aaron said. Together, the three of us lifted Jeff on the floor. He grimaced in pain. Be careful, he yelled at us. We deposited him carefully inside the wheelbarrow. All right, Aaron said, looking at me and Dante. Let's grab as much of that stuff as we came here for as we can and meet back here as quickly as possible. And keep your eyes out for any more traps. We split up. I loaded my backpack with as many candles as I could, then went back to rendezvous with Aaron and Dante. Aaron had loaded his backpack, and also put additional stuff in the wheelbarrow, packing it around Jeff. Here, Aaron said, taking a brand new flashlight out of its packaging, loading it with fresh batteries, and handing it to me. Dante came running back with his own backpack. Do you find any kerosene? Aaron asked him. Uh, no, but I found some battery-powered lanterns in the camping stuff, he said. Good. All right. Let's get the hell out of Dodge, he said, lifting up the wheelbarrow by its handles. We followed him as he wheeled Jeff to the back of the store through a set of doors marked Employees Only. 
We hurried past an employee break room, a set of employee restrooms, a locker room, and entered the shipping and receiving area in the rear of the store. There was a long row of loading docks in the back wall and a metal service door. Dante pushed the door open, and immediately a pair of rotting arms reached in and grabbed at him. He shouted and lunged back. A corpse charged through the door. Dante fired his shotgun, obliterating its head. It liquefied. Look out, Aaron shouted. There's more. More corpses were crowding into the doorway. I pulled my handgun, pushing the safety of it off as Aaron showed me, aimed, and fired. The gun jerked back in my hand. Another corpse was hit between the eyes. Dante and I fired our guns into the crowd of corpses in the doorway. Then he bolted forward, grabbing the door, and yanked it shut. Instantly, more corpses began pounding on it from outside. Fuck, Dante said, rattled. He began to pace distractedly, repeating, Fuck, 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 over and over again. They must be encircling the building, Aaron said grimly. There was a bleak look on his face that scared me. We're trapped in here. What the fuck are we going to do? I asked, looking at him, then to Dante. They just stared back at me with frightened eyes. Neither of them answered me. The dead things outside continued to pound on the service door and moan. Aaron ran his hands through his hair, rubbing his head, trying to think. He glanced out a small window high in the wall of the shipping and receiving area. The gray daylight had faded some since we had been here. We have to come up with something, and fast, he said. We're running out of daylight. How long do we have before it gets dark? I asked him. I'm guessing maybe a couple more hours, if that. Why not just hole up in here for the night and try to come up with a plan tomorrow? I asked. They can't get in here, and we got plenty of candles and flashlights to keep us safe from the shadow lurkers. Yeah, but Clark and Nadine back at the police station don't. Dante shot back. Their supplies won't hold out for the night. We gotta get back to them before they run out, or else they're toast. He was right. I had completely forgotten about Clark and Nadine. Maybe we can distract them somehow, lure them away from the door. Jeff suggested. How? Aaron asked. One of us could sneak outside, draw them away, and the other can take off in the other direction. No, it's too risky. Besides, that won't do us any good if they're surrounding the building on all four sides. My eyes locked onto something. Across the room, a metal ladder was bolted to the wall, leading to a trap door in the ceiling. Printed on the bottom of the trap door were the words, Rooftop Access. Hey, I said, check this out. I pointed to the ladder. We gathered around it. Let's go up and see what it looks like down below, Aaron said. He climbed the ladder and pushed the trap door open, climbing out onto the roof. Me and Dante went up after him. Sure enough, in the center of the roof stood a huge, ancient-looking bronze bell in a wooden frame. A thin metal wire leading up through a hole in the roof was attached to the top of it. The same wire that had trapped Jeff's ankle. We stopped for a moment to consider the bell. Pretty clever of them, Aaron commented. They must be getting smarter. How the fuck did they get it up here? Dante asked. Who the fuck knows? Aaron said. Maybe they hoisted it up with a pulley. Come on. We moved across the expensive rooftop to the front of the store and peered over the edge. Oh, fuck. Aaron groans, horrified. Dante and I were speechless. Down below, hundreds upon hundreds of the residents of Deadland were massed in front of the store covering a good chunk of the parking lot. They pounded and moaned at the entrance doors in a frenzy, and more could be seen in the distance, making their way here. Oh, Christ, it looks like the whole fucking town's down there, Dante said. There must be a thousand of them, I observed. We walked along the perimeter of the building, down the side to the back. They were scattered pretty thin along the sides, and in the rear there were only about fifty of them clustered around the service door. What the fuck are we gonna do? I asked Aaron. If we can clear them out somehow from around the door, we can cut out and slip away, then circle around to the front and take off back to the highway, he said. 
If we shoot them, it'll just attract more from the front, I pointed out. Yeah, besides, we don't have enough ammunition, Dante added, hopelessly. Shit, man, we're totally fucked. Game over. An idea hit me right then. Wait, those cans of gasoline we brought along. What about them? Dante asked. We can use them as Molotov cocktails, drop them down on them. It'll hold them back long enough for us to get away. Aaron snapped his fingers with excitement. Now that's using your head. He glanced up at the darkening sky. We have to hurry, though. We climbed down the ladder back into the store. Jeff, sitting in the wheelbarrow, looked at us anxiously. What's going on? We got a plan to get out of here, Aaron told them. He looked at me and Dante. Go get those gas cans and see if you can find some empty bottles or jars, and some hand towels. We nodded and raced back into the store. I raced to the front and grabbed the gas cans, which were still sitting where we had left them by the entrance we had come in through. As I turned to run back to the back of the store, I glanced at the entrance doors, and I felt my blood turn to ice water. The glass panes were still intact, but the metal frames of the doors themselves were beginning to buckle and bulge inward under the combined weight of the horde that was still throwing itself against them in a constant onslaught. They wouldn't hold much longer. Oh shit, I muttered, then ran back through the store to the back. Dante, I yelled out. Hurry up, man. They're starting to break down the doors. I'm coming, he called back. He came running down an aisle in my direction, holding a box of canning jars and some towels. We just about reached the door, marked employees only, when there came the sounds of twisting, shrieking metal, followed by a crash from the front of the store. The moans of the walking corpses grew louder. Fuck, they're inside, Dante screamed. We pushed through the double doors, and Dante turned and shut them, turning a deadbolt to secure them. We raced through the shipping and receiving area. Behind us, I heard the corpses begin to pound on the door. What the fuck was that sound? Aaron asked as we reached him and Jeff. They got into the store, I said. Christ, he said. Those doors ain't gonna hold them out for long, Dante said. We gotta hurry. We got to work, hastily filling the jars with gasoline. Aaron cut the towels into strips and used his pocket knife to punch a hole into each of the jars' lids. He forced the makeshift wicks into the holes. When he was finished, we had about a dozen Molotov cocktails. Aaron dumped the contents of his backpack out and replaced them with the cocktails. Who's gonna go up top and drop them? Dante asked. The three of us exchanged looks. Should we draw straws? I asked. There's no time. I'll do it, Aaron said. Aaron, I started to protest. No time to argue. Dante, you push Jeff. Kid, you cover him. He handed me his shotgun. When you hear me give the go-ahead, open that door and run like hell. He pushed on his backpack and went to the ladder that led to the rooftop. He gave me a reassuring smile. Don't worry, I'll catch up. He ascended the ladder. We got into position by the service door. Dante picked up the handles of Jeff's wheelbarrow. We waited. A couple minutes later, I heard an explosion from outside, shattering glass followed by the roar of fire, then the sound of the corpses shrieking in pain. Then another explosion. Then another. After several more explosions, we faintly heard Aaron shouting at us from above. Now! Dante and I looked at each other, our faces tense with fear. Then Dante pushed open the door. The second the door opened, the stench of gasoline and burning flesh overwhelmed me, stinging my nostrils. A pile of blackened bodies lay scattered around the door, some still burning, most of them still moving slightly. The ones that were dead, well, really dead, had already liquefied. Puddles of burning gasoline were everywhere. The air was thick with smoke. Go! I shouted at Dante, who quickly shoved Jeff's wheelbarrow through the door. I paused for a split second behind him so I could yell up the ladder and through the trap door in the ceiling. Hurry up, Aaron! Then I raced after them. Dante wheeled Jeff down the back of the Walmart in the direction of the parking lot. Jeff was sitting up in the wheelbarrow with his handgun raised in front of him. 
I glanced behind me and saw a group of residents coming around the other end of the store and heading in our direction. Hurry up, I shouted to Dante. I'm moving as fast as I can, he yelled back at me. We reached the edge of the building and turned the corner. Most of the horde was still congregated in front of the store, but there were still several dozen scattered across the far end of the parking lot. Dante pushed Jeff ahead of him in a wild dash, dodging around the corpses, skirting the main parking lot, racing towards the highway. I was right behind Dante. I felt something grab me from behind. A corpse had a hold of me, clutching my backpack. I tried to pull away, but its grip was too strong. I quickly slid out the backpack straps and left it behind. Another corpse lunged at the wheelbarrow and Jeff fired his pistol, blasting it in the head. The gunshot alerted the horde and instantly they turned as a whole, spotting us. They began screaming in unison and charged in our direction. They were no more than a hundred yards away. Oh shit, I screamed, panicked. The crowd surged towards us, closing the distance. There was no way we could outrun them. I knew we were about to die. Suddenly, something arched through the air with a streak of flame. Glass shattered on the pavement, and a fireball erupted between us and the horde, causing them to draw back fearfully. I looked around and saw Aaron sprinting towards us, fumbling in his backpack for another Molotov cocktail. Move your asses, he screamed at us turning with a Bic lighter in one hand and a Molotov in the other. He quickly lit it and hurled it at the horde. Another fireball splashed up, separating the mass of homicidal walking cadavers from us. I felt a fleeting sense of relief to see Aaron had made it. He caught up with us, panting. That was my last one. Hurry the fuck up. We gotta get out of here. We were about three quarters of the way to the front end of the parking lot, nearly home free. For a split second, I thought we were going to be okay. Then, I spotted the huge pothole in the pavement directly in front of Dante and Jeff. Dante, in a blind panic, was heading right for it. Look out! I shouted, but it was already too late. Dante drove Jeff's wheelbarrow right into the pothole. The wheelbarrow outbalanced and turned over, spilling Jeff and the supplies piled around him onto the ground. He screamed as his injured ankle struck the asphalt. Oh, fuck, Aaron shouted. Him and I ran to help. We gotta get him back up, Dante screamed. He and Aaron began reaching down to grab Jeff. I spun around. My heart sank. The flames were already dying down, and the horde had resumed its relentless pursuit. The closest was only about three yards away. Some of them were in flames, but they pushed on regardless. They're coming! I shouted to the others. Dante and Aaron looked. We gotta go, now! Dante said grimly. We can't leave Jeff! Aaron screamed at him. No! Jeff hissed through clenched teeth, a grimace of pain fixed on his face. Dante's right. There isn't enough time. I'm fucked. Leave me. And save your own asses. The fuck we will. Aaron yelled at him. Jeff pointed his pistol in Aaron's face. Aaron froze in shock. Jeff spoke in a very calm but intense voice. I am not asking. I am telling. Leave me and go. Better one of us die than all four. Now go. Aaron looked at me and Dante. There was a look of mournful resignation on his face. Let's get the fuck out of here. I'll try and hold them back, Jeff said, raising his pistol to the fast-approaching horde. The three of us ran across the remaining stretch of parking lot back onto the streets we had come in on. There weren't many residents on the street. Behind us, I heard Jeff firing his pistol repeatedly. Then, he stopped shooting and began to scream. I threw a final look back. I still wish I hadn't. They had surrounded Jeff and were beginning to tear him apart. I saw Jeff, in final desperation, raise the pistol to his own temple. He pulled the trigger. The gun was empty. 
We ran. Jeff's dying, agonized screams followed after us until he fell silent. For a while after Jeff's death, everything was kind of a disordered blur. My memory of the immediate aftermath of our escape is hazy and jumbled from the terror and the shock of losing one of our number in such a brutal, horrific manner. I remember Dante stopping and turning to face the corpses, screaming and shouting incoherently and emptying his shotgun into the horde, racking the slide and pulling the trigger on an empty chamber over and over, crying hysterically until Aaron slapped him to bring him back to his senses. I remember a resident that was hardly more than a skeleton in the tattered remains of what looked to have once been the uniform of a Civil War Union soldier trying to ambush us from behind a parked car as we ran by it. Aaron simply clubbed it aside with his shotgun. We ran for our lives, the mob of undead maniacs pursuing us all the while. Somehow, at some point... We lost them, and managed to escape town and get back on the open road. When we finally felt safe, for the time being anyway, we halted in the middle of the road, winded and gasping to catch our breath. I glanced back toward the town, but there was no sign of them. I doubled over and began to retch. I felt like I was going to vomit, but could only dry heave. There was nothing in my stomach to regurgitate. The last meal I had eaten had been the breakfast my mother had made for me the day before. It dawned on me suddenly that it had been the last meal I had consumed in the mortal world, and probably the last meal I would ever consume. Period. Dante was still weeping quietly. We left him. We fucking left him. He kept repeating. Aaron tried to console him. He wanted us to leave him, Dante. It's my fault. I wasn't paying attention. Even if you hadn't hit that pothole, Aaron told him, there's no way we could have wheeled him fast enough to outrun him. We all would have died. Jeff knew the risks when he volunteered. We all did. I don't know how much more of this shit I could take, Dante admitted. I don't know why we're even bothering to try... I just want it to be over. We have to stay alive, Aaron told him adamantly. We have to keep fighting as long as possible. You know what the alternative is. Maybe we really are dead, Aaron. Have you ever thought of that? Maybe this is hell. Me and Aaron looked at him. Neither of us said anything. Did you see what was painted on the side of the church when we were running back through town? Dante asked us. What? Aaron asked, confused. There was a message painted in black on the side of the church, probably by some poor bastard who was stuck here before us. We didn't see it the first time because it was facing the other direction. But I saw it when we were running, after Jeff died. He looked at us. Neither of you saw it. Aaron and I looked at each other and shook our heads. We had been too busy running for our lives to notice. No, I said. What was it? It said, God has abandoned us, Dante said. I felt a chill creep up my spine. Aaron glanced up at the darkened gray sky. He looked worried. We better get moving, he said. I doubt we've got even an hour left before it gets dark. There's no way we'll get back to the police station before nightfall. I pointed out. The kid's right, Dante said. There's not enough time. We'll just have to use lanterns to ward off the lurkers, Aaron said. I just hope the light doesn't attract any residents on the way. We started on the return journey to the police station. The fading light grew dimmer and dimmer. It might have been twilight, but it was hard to judge the time without the sun to use for reference. As the light failed and the night began to descend, I felt an increasing sense of external dread and fear. I felt how I imagined a hunted animal might feel when it detects the scent of an approaching predator. I seemed to sense something coming awake in the encroaching darkness, seemed to feel the air becoming heavier, 
pressing down on us with a malevolent presence, something just beyond human perception, something that was coming for us. Let's get the lanterns going, Aaron said, stopping and turning to Dante. Uh, yeah, sure, Dante said, removing his backpack and unpacking three battery-powered Coleman LED lanterns. Please tell me you got some batteries, Aaron said to him. You bet, Dante said, taking out a pack of D batteries. He quickly loaded the batteries into the lanterns and switched them on. I was relieved when we were bathed in a circle of bright white illumination. I seemed to feel that presence recoil from us, repelled by the light. Here, Dante said, handing me a lantern. How much further to the station? I asked Aaron, as we resumed walking. Maybe another hour, if we don't encounter any residents, he told me. Something occurred to me. I remembered something from earlier. Hey, Aaron, I said. Back when we were in town, trying to get away from those things, one of them looked like it was wearing a Civil War soldier uniform. He chuckled, dryly. Maybe the guy was into reenactments when he was alive and was buried in his costume. Or maybe he was a real Civil War soldier. Really? I said, surprised. You think it's possible? Why the fuck not? Who knows how long Deadland's been around? It's not just the recent dead who show up here. Lost souls from all eras. But why is everything else so modern around here? Why are there gas stations and Walmarts and... Kid, he interrupted me, getting annoyed. There's no point in questioning anything about this fucking place. In case you haven't noticed, there's not a lot of rhyme or reason here. Why are the cars all dead and there's no electricity, but bullets and batteries still work? Why do candles and gasoline still burn? If you ask yourself too many questions, if you really stop and think about how illogical this all is, you'll drive yourself crazy. Believe me, I've seen it happen. He had a point. We walked in silence for a while, Dante behind us. Aaron. I said, I have a personal question for you, if you don't mind me asking. Ask, but don't expect an answer. Why'd you try killing yourself? He didn't answer me right away. I wondered if maybe I'd stepped out of line. We walked for a couple of minutes. Then he sighed and said, All right, I'll tell you. I had a girlfriend. I guess we were in love. Maybe I would have even eventually gotten around to marrying her. She was pregnant with my kid. She wanted to keep it, but I wasn't ready yet. I wanted her to get rid of it. We argued. She slapped me. I lost my cool and slapped her back. She left me. Had an abortion. Met someone else. I got depressed. Became a drunk. Lost my job. All my friends and family bailed out on me when I needed them. I was getting evicted from my apartment, so I just said fuck it and put my belt around my neck in the closet. End of story. He turned and looked at me. Happy now? I'm sorry, I muttered. So am I, but it doesn't change anything. I'm still here, and so are you. Saying I'm sorry is the cheapest sentiment in the world. It and a bark will get you a cup of coffee. I didn't know what to say to that. We continued on our way. It was almost fully dark now. A while later, Aaron halted and motioned for me and Dante to stop. He peered into the darkness. Something's up ahead, he whispered to us, then took his binoculars out of his jacket. What good are those going to do in the dark? I whispered. These aren't the ones I used before, he explained. I picked these up while we were at Walmart. They have night vision. Thought they might come in handy. He raised his new binoculars and peered through them. Shit. It's that farmhouse we passed earlier. Great, I muttered sarcastically. We definitely can't walk by it with the lanterns. They'll spot us for sure. And we sure as fuck can't turn them off. Not until we get back into the station. So, what? The cornfield again? 
I suggested. You got it, he told me. We got off the road and once again skirted the farmhouse using the cornfield for cover. We got past the farmhouse and back onto the highway without incident. I looked up at the night sky. It was a solid, inky black, unlike any I had ever seen, unbroken by stars or clouds. There was no sign of the moon. It was alien and frightening. I felt like I was standing on a different planet. Sometime later, I heard Dante, still behind us, groan. Oh shit, with a sound of dread in his voice. Me and Aaron turned around. Dante looked at the lantern in his hand. It had begun to flicker very lightly. He looked at us, scared. The batteries are dying. Shit, I hissed. Already? Finding good batteries is a crap shoot in Deadland, Aaron told me. You never know how old they are. They usually don't last for long. That's why we go through them so fast. Have you got any more in your pockets? I asked Dante. Uh, fuck no. I thought Aaron was the one who was supposed to stock up the batteries. I turned to Aaron, who looked at me grimly. I dumped out most of my batteries in my pack to make room for the Molotov cocktails. What about you, kid? I shook my head. I lost my pack to those things when we made a run for it. What about candles? Aaron asked Dante. Yeah, I got boxes of those, he answered. If the batteries and the lanterns start to go bad, we'll just have to switch to candles, he said. Dante, stay close to us in case your lantern goes out. We kept walking. A few minutes later, I heard Dante yell, Shit! and looked around. His lantern had died. He threw it away in disgust and we moved on. Dante being careful to stay within the circle of light from Aaron's and my lanterns. Not long after that, Aaron's lantern began to flicker just like Dante's had. Fuck, Aaron muttered. Look, I said, pointing. Just ahead of us was the manhole we had emerged from earlier that day, marked with the big orange X Aaron had painted. Dante laughed with relief. Hot damn, we're in the home stretch now. Aaron set down his faltering lantern, knelt, and used his crowbar to pry up the man cover. You first, kid, he said, indicating to me. I put the handle of my lantern in my mouth and climbed down into the sewer. Dante was right behind me. At the top, Aaron, his own lantern clapped between his teeth, slid the manhole cover back in place, and descended the ladder. As we reached the bottom, his lantern which had begun to flicker rapidly while he was still moving the manhole cover, suddenly dimmed, then went out altogether, leaving only mine. Motherfucker! Aaron snapped angrily and threw it away. He turned to Dante. Let's have those candles now before the kid's lantern conks out. Dante took a box of them out of his backpack and we each removed one. Aaron fumbled out his Bic lighter and flicked the wheel. It sparked but didn't light. He tried again, and again. Oh fuck, oh fuck, no, are you fucking kidding me? He moaned with rising panic as he first shook the lighter, then whacked it against his leg before trying once again to light it without success. He looked at me and Dante, scared. Out of fuel. I looked at Dante. You had a lighter? Or matches? Dante. His eyes wide, shook his head. How far are we from the police station? I asked Aaron. Just a couple miles. We can make it, I said. We still got a lantern. And no sooner had I spoken, as if to mock our plight, my lantern began to flicker unsteadily, and the batteries started to fail. Run. Aaron shouted to me and Dante. Stay as close together as you can and run. Run as fast as you fucking can. Don't slow down for nothing. And so we did. Once again we ran. Not just for our lives this time, but also for our very souls. We ran as if all of Hell's demons were chasing us, and perhaps they were. Aaron led the way, relying on his memory to navigate the sewer system because there was no time to stop and consult his map. A left here, a right there. 
me and Dante racing behind him. I could only hope he was going the right way, if we got lost down here before the lantern gave out. The lantern in my hand was flickering more rapidly, and the batteries weakened. I don't know how much longer it would last. Any second I expected it to go out, plunging us into total darkness. Then I would see those red eyes all around me, would still feel the shadow lurkers surrounding me, closing in. This way, Aaron yelled, pointing down a junction in the sewer tunnel. This is it. Less than a mile. We can make it. We turned into a narrow tunnel I remembered from when we had first set out earlier that day. Dante was right behind me. I could hear him panting with exertion as he struggled to keep up. Several hundred yards later, I saw it materializing directly ahead of us, the ladder to the police station parking garage. Salvation. We're almost there, Aaron screamed. Behind me, I heard Dante cry out in alarm. I spun around. I could dimly see Dante, in shadow, lying face first on the filthy sewer floor. He had slipped or tripped or something. He sat up and began to get to his feet. He had fallen just beyond the reach of the lantern's light. I started following to bring him back into the circle of safety, but it was already too late. The darkness around him came to life. Hundreds of black hands seized him with the speed of a rattlesnake striking. I could see the lantern's light glinting in Dante's terrified eyes, a glimpse that lasted only a second. The next, he was gone. There was nothing left, not a single sign that he had ever been there. He never even had time to scream. I stood there, looking in numb shock. Aaron, standing just behind me, had also witnessed Dante's end. He's gone, he said to me. There's nothing we could do. Come on, we have to keep going. We ran to the ladder. Aaron scrambled up to it and began to pound on the underside of the manhole cover. Clark! He screamed in desperation. Clark, it's us. Open up. Hurry, for God's sake. There's not much time. I put the lantern's handle between my teeth and climbed up after Aaron. I could faintly hear a scraping sound as Clark moved aside of the wheelbarrow weighed down with cinder blocks. Then the manhole cover was lifted, and Clark's kerosene lantern bathed me and Aaron in its protective glow. Aaron climbed out of the sewer. I was right behind him. As I got to my feet, the battery-powered lantern gripped in my mouth, flickered a final time, dimmed, then died. I threw the dead lantern down into the sewer. Clark looked at me and Aaron, wide-eyed and relieved. Jesus, thank God you're back. You guys were gone so long. Natalie and I were starting to think... He trailed off. He regarded me and Aaron, then looked expectantly at the manhole leading down into the sewer. He looked for several seconds, then looked back to Aaron, his expression becoming somber with realization. Dante? Jeff? Aaron didn't answer him. Neither did I. We didn't need to. Our expressions said it all. Clark lowered his head, and his shoulders sagged with understanding. God, he whimpered. Close the fucking manhole, Clark. Then let's go upstairs, Aaron told him. Clark pushed the manhole cover back in place and replaced the wheelbarrow. Nadine was sitting on her cot with her legs drawn up, knees under her chin, staring into space, her face drawn and anxious as Aaron and I entered the police chief's office. She looked at us and reacted, first startled, then relieved. She sprung to her feet. You made it, she said, sounding happy for the first time since I had met her. Two of us made it, Aaron corrected her bleakly as he sat down on his cot. Clark entered behind us and shut the door. Nadine's happy expression collapsed in an instant, and her morose demeanor returned as it sank in. She was silent for several long minutes. Dante and Jeff. Gone, Aaron told her flatly. She lowered her head into her hands. What about supplies? Clark asked Aaron anxiously. How'd you guys make out? 
At this, Aaron emitted a shrill, protracted sound that could have been either a wail of despair or the stark, humorless laugh of someone at the very edge of reason. He removed his backpack and dumped out what was left in it. All we had to show for our expedition. A single box containing ten emergency candles. That was all. Ten candles. That was what Jeff and Dante had sacrificed their lives for, and what Aaron and I had risked our own over. Ten fucking candles. Ten candles that might offer us protection from the Shadow Lurkers for three days, and surely no more than four. And that was if we were lucky. Ten six-inch sticks of wax. That's what Jeff and Dante's lives had been worth. It had all been for nothing. I had lost my share of the supplies when my backpack had been snatched from me in the Walmart parking lot. All the extra supplies in the wheelbarrow had been lost with Jeff, and all the stuff in Dante's backpack had been taken with him by the lurkers. The entire trip had been for nothing, and had cost the lives of two of our group. What happened? Nadine demanded, staring coldly at me and Aaron. Tell us what happened. I want to hear everything. We took turns telling her and Clark everything that had happened after we had left the police station that morning. When we finished, there was a long moment of silence. Nadine stood up and walked to one of the barred windows. She stood there, looking out at the blackness. How much ammo do you have left? Clark asked. It didn't take long to find out. The three of us, me, Aaron, and Clark, stood around the police chief's desk, looking down at our nearly exhausted supply. Seven 12-gauge rounds, eleven 45 ACPs, eighteen 9 millimeters. That pretty much says it all, doesn't it? Clark said quietly. There's not enough left to try for another supply run. Aaron said, in a tone of utter hopelessness. We'd be dead for sure if we tried. Nadine, still standing at the window with her back to us, said in a hollow voice, We're already dead. She slowly turns to face us. Her cheeks were streaked with tears. We should just use those guns on ourselves and get it over with. It's better than waiting for the candles to run out. Or those things outside to get smart enough to find a way in here. There's gotta still be useful stuff in town. Stuff close by, we can... Aaron began. No. She thundered at him, her eyes blazing with rage. She was more furious than I had ever seen her. Even if by some miracle you found a stockpile of candles and batteries, then what, Aaron? Then what? How long do you want to keep living like this, if you can even call it living? Hiding here in this fucking prison. Those monsters surrounding us, trapped in a dead, empty world. No hope of ever seeing our families, or feeling the sun, or eating food, or being safe ever again. Is this what you want to risk your lives to keep fighting for? To survive one day in hell, just to find yourself in the next, and the next, and the next. Meeting new people, getting to know them, only for them to end up dying. Never knowing if you're going to be next. I've been enduring this nightmare for eight fucking years, Darren. And that's probably a record. You've only been here two. You think you know about survival? That you're some seasoned pro? Well, fuck you. You don't know the first thing about surviving. You don't even know some of the horrible things I've seen here. I had a boyfriend at one point. Someone I met who for once in my life wasn't a complete piece of shit. Someone I loved. And you know what happened to him? We were being chased by those goddamn corpses, and he ran off to draw them away, so I had a chance of escape. They tore him into pieces while I ran to save myself like a coward. I can still hear him screaming in my mind. You know how many people I've seen get killed? I saw a baby, a newborn baby, helpless, completely defenseless, and... and they... She slumped against the wall, collapsing and started to sob. The three of us just looked at her, taken aback by her outburst, not knowing what to say. She wiped away her tears and fixed us with a stony expression. 
Dante and Jeff are lucky. They found the only real escape. Clark, Aaron, and I looked at each other, and I could see in their eyes they were both thinking exactly what I was. Nadine was right. We would be better off dead, even if what came after death was some hell even worse than this wretched half-state of existence, this living damnation. Clark suddenly groaned. He staggered back, putting a hand to his head. Clark, Aaron asked him, concerned. I don't feel good, Clark began, sounding dazed. And then he collapsed, writhing in excruciating pain. Clark, Aaron screamed and knelt by his side. Oh God, my head hurts. It hurts so fucking bad. Clark wailed, his eyes squeezed shut in agony, his teeth bared. As I watched, all the color, the vitality, the life seemed to fade from his skin, leaving it waxy and pale. What is it? What's wrong? Aaron screamed at him. I'm dying. Clark howled. I'm dying right now. He opened his eyes, looking at Aaron beseechingly. Please. He gasped through gritted teeth, imploring desperately. Please, Aaron, kill me now. Shoot me before I die. I don't want to turn like Lauren. I don't want to be one of them, even for a second. Aaron stood and grabbed one of the pistols from the desk. He quickly loaded a single round. All right, Clark, he said solemnly and chambered the round. He knelt and placed the barrel between Clark's eyes. He pulled the trigger. Aaron and I stood over Clark's corpse, looking at him in silent regard. He lay with a small round hole between and slightly above his eyes, a red puddle slowly spreading out from his head. He didn't liquefy into black slime like the residents did when you killed them. Maybe it was because he had still been human when he died. His eyes were closed, and his expression was peaceful, maybe even relieved. I stared at him, imagining his mortal body in some other realm at this very moment, hooked up to life support machines in a hospital room, all his vital signs now negative the shrill screech of an EKG as he flatlined. Maybe his family, assuming he had one, was gathered around him, their faces streaked with tears, a nurse covering him with a sheet, a priest there to offer spiritual consultation, assuring them that he was in a better place now. And who knew, maybe now he truly was. He surely wasn't an inhabitant of Deadland anymore. And any place had to be an improvement over here. And then there were three. Aaron whispered beside me. I waited to hear Nadine's response. Something cynical and sarcastic, but she said nothing. Gradually, I registered that me and Aaron were alone in the candlelit room. I looked around. Hey, I said. Where's Nadine? Aaron looked and saw she was gone. Nadine? He called out. Shit, where the hell did she go? She must have slipped out while we were busy with Clark, I said. Christ, what the fuck could she be doing? He said, grabbing a candle. He thrust it into my hand and took one for himself. Come on, we gotta find her. We left the police chief's office. We didn't have to look very long to find her. Over here, she calmly called to us from the end of the police station corridor. We looked and froze. Nadine was standing in the lobby by the barricaded entrance doors. Residents were pounding and snarling behind the reinforced glass. They could see Nadine inside, living prey, and the sight was causing them to become increasingly agitated. Nadine smiled at us. It was a strangely serene smile, almost beautiful in a way, 
the smile of a woman who had finally found some measure of inner peace. In one hand, she was holding a burning candle of her own. Her other hand was grasping the padlock securing the chains wrapped around the entrance door handles. The padlock had been unfastened. Nadine must have taken the key. And the chromed steel shackle of the lock was barely holding the ends of the chains together. We were stunned, silent for a moment. Then Aaron spoke. Nadine, he said, slowly and cautiously. What are you doing? It's better this way, Aaron. Better for all of us. We're just prolonging the inevitable. It'll be a horrible way to go. Painful. But only for a few moments. Then it'll be over. And we'll be free. Once and for all, we'll be free. Her voice was very calm and resolved. It almost sounded sane. God damn it, Nadine. You don't know that, Aaron argued, trying to reason with her. What if dying just leads to something even worse? I'll take that chance, Nadine said, still smiling. Then he yanked off the padlocks, releasing the chains. Instantly, the door burst open and a horde of residents flooded into the station. Dozens of them. Hate life. Hate living. Hate life. Hate living. Holy shit, Aaron screamed. Nadine was swarmed. They dragged her down, piling on top of her, ripping her apart. She never screamed. Not once. More residents poured into our former safe haven, charging in the direction of me and Aaron. Aaron grabbed me by the arm and screamed in my face. Back into the office, hurry! We fled the invading horde down the corridor and dodged back into the police chief's office, slamming the door. Aaron locked the door, then looked at it. He was shaking with barely controlled panic. This door won't hold them back for long. We gotta barricade it. His eyes darted wildly across the office. He pointed. The desk. Help me move it. We struggled to lift the heavy oak desk and carried it to the door. The ammunition still piled on top, rolled off, and scattered in every direction. The frosted glass pane in the top half of the police chief's door shattered inwards, and half a dozen rotted arms reached us, grabbing for us. We placed the desk against the door, but it only came up waist high, leaving the top half with the shattered window exposed. Help me with this filing cabinet, Aaron ordered me. We lifted the filing cabinet and stacked it on top of the desk. It blocked the shattered window. We piled more stuff on the desk, a lamp, a chair, or one of the cots, until we had it pretty well barricaded. We could still hear the crazed corpses screaming their endless, repetitive chant outside. Safe for the moment, we collapsed against the barricade to catch our breath. The crazy fucking bitch, Aaron muttered in disbelief. I can't believe she actually did that. Maybe she thought she was doing us a favor... I offered. We're trapped, Aaron said, quietly, as if just realizing it himself. He looked at me, smiling bitterly. I saw there were tears in his eyes. We're fucked, kid. You understand that, right? We are officially El Fucko. There's gotta be something that we can... I didn't finish. Even as I was speaking, Aaron's words were sinking in, and I was realizing he was absolutely right. There was no way out of this. No avenues left we could pursue. Even if we could somehow escape the infested police station, we would still be trapped in Deadland. There were only two of us left now. There was very little ammunition, even fewer candles, and no places we could take refuge. I saw just how utterly hopeless her situation was, and the weight of this realization threatens to overwhelm me. I realized I was starting to cry. The way I see it, we have three options. 
Aaron said. One, we can wait until they break through the barricade and let them kill us. Two, we can try fighting them off with whatever ammo we have left and wait till the candles run out and the shadow lurkers take us. Or three. He took out his pistol, ejected the magazine, picked up two bullets off the floor, loaded them into the magazine, replaced the magazine, and chambered around. Which sounds preferable to you? He asked me. Just make it quick. I told him. He placed the pistol between my eyes. It was nice knowing you, kid. Same, I told him, trying to keep the tremble out of my voice. I braced myself for the shots, wondering where I was going to wake up next time. He started to pull the trigger, but then stopped. He looked at me, at first, puzzled, then shocked. What is it? I asked him. What? What's happening to you? Aaron said. What do you mean? I asked him, confused. Look at your hand. Can't you see it? I raised my hand to my eyes. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My hand was turning transparent. I could see the wall of the office through my palm. As I watched, bewildered, it grew more and more transparent and ghost-like, as if I was losing substance, fading out of reality. I realized it wasn't just my hand. My entire body was slowly turning invisible. What the fuck is happening to me? I screamed in panic. Aaron just looked at me with incomprehension. Then, a new look dawned in his eyes. An expression I hadn't seen during my entire time in Deadland. Hope. Kid, I don't know for sure. I never saw this before. But I think maybe you're starting to wake up. Return to the land of the living. And as I was fading out of reality, reality was fading away from me. Aaron and the police chief's office were growing dim and hazy. I could feel myself drifting away, being pulled back to the living world, out of Deadland. Aaron spoke to me one final time, his voice growing fainter with every word. My ex-girlfriend's name is Anna Hastings. Find her if you can. Tell her she was right about me. I was a coward. We should have kept it. But tell her. But that was all I could make out. Aaron's voice faded into silence. The last thing I saw was Aaron raising the pistol to his own temple. Then, he dissolved out of view. Everything dissolved. Once again... I was plunged into blackness. Once again, I was floating weightlessly in the void, drifting like a feather through the silent blackness of oblivion. However, instead of falling downward for what seemed an eternity, now I was rising slowly upwards like a deep-sea diver ascending from the depths. The first sound I became aware of was a computerized beep at a steady, regular pace. The first physical sensation I became aware of was a throbbing pain in my head. The first smell I became aware of was the sterile, chemical smell of a hospital. The first image I became aware of was a radiant, bright whiteness that seemed to fill my vision like the light of heaven. As my blurry vision gradually cleared, it resolved into a fluorescent light fixture in the ceiling above me. I looked groggily down the length of my body and saw I was lying in a hospital bed and wearing a hospital gown, my bottom half covered with a sheet, assorted wires attached to various parts of my body, an IV line taped to my inner arm. I reached up and gingerly touched the top of my aching skull. My upper head was encased in thick bandages. I heard a familiar voice cry out in shock that quickly became frantic joy. He's awake. Oh, thank God, he's awake. It was my mother's anxious voice, nearly shouting in mingled relief and excitement. 
I glanced over and saw my parents sitting in chairs by my bed, both of them pale and worn-looking from exhaustion and worry. In a flash, my parents were up and by my side. My mother seized my arm in a fierce grip, weeping hysterically and saying my name over and over. I looked at them, warily, my guard up, not quite ready to allow myself to believe that I was really awake and back in the land of the living. I distinctly remembered that nightmare I had experienced on the other night, when I had seemed to wake up safely back in my room and my mother had entered to check on me. I watched my parents' faces cautiously, expecting them to, at any second, begin shriveling up and drawing tight into their skulls, their lips peeling back from bare teeth, their eyes sinking into their skulls. But it never happened. I was truly awake and back home this time. And when the realization hit me, I began to weep with relief myself and embraced my parents as I hadn't since I had been a small child. My parents summoned a nurse who then paged a doctor to come see me. He inspected me, shining a light in my eyes and asking me some questions. My full name, my parents' name, my address, my date of birth, etc., the final thing he asked me was what the last thing I remembered was before waking up in the hospital. I opened my mouth. I almost told him the truth. Aaron looked at me, smiling, happy for me, but also sad. The pistol raised to his temple, but then bit down hard on the words. There was no point of getting into any of what I had experienced on the other side. In that hellish netherworld the denizens referred to as Deadland. They wouldn't understand, wouldn't believe me, would tell me it had just been a bad dream. And for all I knew, perhaps that's all it had been. I told the doctor the last thing I remembered was the man with the bald, tattooed head and leather vest aiming his gun at me in the convenience store and pulling the trigger. I asked the doctor how long I had been unconscious and was floored by his response. Almost three weeks. For three weeks, I had hovered in a limbo between life and death. Even though my entire ordeal in Deadland had seemed to almost last about a day and a half, the others had been right. Time did pass strangely over there. The doctor explained to me that the bullets the gunman had fired had hit me in the upper forehead about an inch above my left eye, but miraculously only fractured my skull without penetrating it or my brain before being deflected off my skull plate. But still, my injury had been very serious. The impact had caused a severe concussion and brain swelling the doctors had had to alleviate by performing surgery, opening my skull to remove the pressure from my brain. I asked the doctor just how close I had come to death, he was reluctant to answer at first, but after I insisted, he relented and told me. Very close. We weren't sure if we were going to bring you back. They hadn't been sure I would ever awaken from my coma, or if I would have brain damage when and if I did. The police came by a few hours after I woke from my coma to ask me some questions about what happened in the convenience store. I learned that after shooting me, the man with the gun had also turned his pistol on the clerk, who hadn't been so lucky, and had died on the spot. The robber had gotten away before the police and paramedics arrived, but he was caught a couple months later, holding up another convenience store in a different county. The guy, a meth-head biker with a criminal record as long as a broom handle, was sentenced to 25 years for the murder of the convenience store clerk and the attempted murder of me. However, with good behavior, he could be up for parole in only half of that amount of time. I never told anyone what happened to me during those three weeks I was in a coma. Not until now, anyway. I would love to tell you, and myself, none of it actually happened. That it was just some incredibly vivid, surreal nightmare I experienced following my surgery. But that would be a lie. You see... Around the same time I was waking up in the intensive care unit, a different comatose patient in the same hospital, a 28-year-old man named Aaron Thomas, who had been on life support for almost two years following his suicide attempt, flatlined and died. Two days earlier, 
Nadine Stance, a 36-year-old prostitute and drug addict who had been clinically brain-dead and in a vegetative state for eight years following an overdose, passed away. I guess that when you enter Deadland, you retain the age you were when you arrived, even after your physical body continues to age. The same day Nadine died, Clark Stevenson, a 37-year-old auto mechanic and father of four, died peacefully after lying in a coma for about six months with a slow-growing but terminal brain tumor. Three days before Clark, Dante Ferguson, a 27-year-old African-American who had been in a coma since Halloween 2010 after a car accident that had claimed the lives of three friends, died. And a week before Dante died, 19-year-old Jeff Hewitt died about four months in a coma following an accident while swimming in a lake. I know all of this because I looked them up online. Their news articles and obituaries. Their pictures. I looked up Aaron's ex-girlfriends, Anna Hastings, but couldn't bring myself to deliver his final message to her in person. She would have thought I was crazy or playing some cruel prank. Instead, I mailed an anonymous letter to her house, telling her what he said. It was the least I could have done for him. It's been seven years, and I'm 22 now, and about to graduate college. I have a girlfriend I love, and hope one day to make my wife and have kids. I try to live every day to the fullest, try to make the most of every precious moment of this life here on Earth. Because I know what awaits us all after death.